Welcome to Never a Truer Word, where we look at the words that people choose to use to find out a little bit more about what is going on underneath the surface. And in this video, we're going to look at the death of Grant Solomon and the statements of his father, Aaron Solomon. The case of Grant Solomon has been getting a lot of attention recently. Grant died in July 2020 in Tennessee. He was meeting his father, Aaron, for baseball practice or an assessment of some kind. Uh, Aaron is the only thing close to a witness that we have uh, to the events that happened. Officially, Grant's death has been ruled to be an accident. His truck rolled over him. However, some, as you can see there, believe there is more to it. It's a fascinating case, and there's lots of good podcasts if you want to delve deeper into this. There's one called Corruption, The Death of Grant Solomon, uh, which is an entire series devoted to real detailed uh, look at what went on. Um, Body Bags podcast has done a real forensic dive into this. True Crime Garage has done a couple of episodes on it. Even Kendall Ray has covered this story. We are live right now doing this. So one of the reasons, in fact, the reason I do it live um, is to get you involved. So if you've got any comments, any questions, any observations on what I say, or even better, the words that we see um, used tonight, then please get in touch on the live chat. Just stick them in there and we will deal with them as and when they come around. Or if you're watching this on replay, and I know a few people said they will be watching on replay, then um, put your uh, your what you have to say, put them in the comments. And sometimes it gets hard to reply to them all uh, on these videos, but I do read every comment that comes in on these videos. So let's look at the words of Aaron Solomon talking about what happened the day that his son Grant died. And we're going to analyze his statements using something called truthful deception. Uh, that is uh, a, a process that looks at the words that we use and looks at the choices of words that we make because what we do, whenever we're talking, we use the words we most want to use most of the time. Like when we're talking to our friends or when we're sending someone a quick text, our subconscious takes over that work for us and just picks the words that best thinks fit the truth as our subconscious knows it. Sometimes when we're under stress, like me on this video now, we'll pick words very carefully and deliberately so that we don't make a fool of ourselves or we don't slip up. Whichever mode we're using, we'll pick the words that we best fit, we, bet we think best fit the situation, or the ones we most want to use to get across the image, the story that we want to portray. Whichever mode we're using, we'll be able to pick it up and say, why at that time did Aaron think these were the best words to use? And also, like its name suggests, truthful deception. Generally, as people, we like to stay truthful as much as we can. Lying is hard work. Lying is stressful. So we prefer to stick to the truth, even, even if that means omitting the truth, not mentioning the truth, slipping in a little bit of a lie, but sticking mostly to the truth. And what I won't be doing is looking for just one misspeak or one thing that go makes me go, that's a bit suspicious. Really what we're looking for are repeated concepts. What happens time and time again? Those words will be the most telling. Before we look at the statement, let me say a couple of things. First of all, at the outset, Aaron Solomon denies he played any part in his son's death. It's officially an accident. And in this video, I'm going to share with you my observations on Aaron's statements, but I won't be accusing anyone of anything. And the other thing is I only look at the words. So I've seen lots of people look at the words that I'm going to look at, the statements I'm going to look at in this video um, and talk about the acting, the delivery, the voice tone and so on. I'm going to steer away from that. I'm not an expert in those. I'm only going to look at the words. Now, I am going to look at the statement that Aaron gave law enforcement later on in this video. If you haven't seen that, this, this statement is really going to shock you uh, if you haven't seen it before. But first, we're going to look at the 911 call that Aaron made to report Grant's accident. Uh, so like I say, if you spot anything, if there's anything you want to ask or uh, any observations, get involved in the chat or in the comments. So here's the 911 call. Now, at times, this is obviously a bit of a frantic 911 call, and at times, the operator and Aaron talk over each other. I've tried to separate that out here to make the conversation clearer for us to understand. So at the very start, uh, the operator says, what's your emergency? Aaron says over the top of that, I'm trying. He's talking to someone else, I think. He says, I'm trying. 
And then when he hears the operator say, where's your emergency? Sorry, it's where's your emergency, the operator says. Aaron replies, it is 1357 South Water Street. It's off 109. Please hurry. The operator says, you said 57? And Aaron says something that's a bit unclear, but then he says 1357. <clears throat> now, this is reassuring. Aaron directly answers the question, where's your emergency, with the location with where the emergency is, and also gives a plea for urgency. Please hurry. That's reassuring. Direct answers are good. No storytelling there, no other priorities that the person wants to cover off, just direct answers to the question. So that's good. The operator then says, what's going on? And Aaron says, um, my, my son's truck backed over him and he's, it's rolled over him and drug him into the ditch and it's on top of him. He's trapped under the truck and I, I, yeah, he, are you, somehow it drug him underneath it. Oh, what have we got there? This isn't so good as that first answer. I'd be more reassured to hear the issue first and the explanation afterwards. That would have built the impression from the first answer that Aaron is seeking urgent help for a specific problem. Instead, he starts with an um, as if he's not sure about what's going on, and then a stutter, as if he's not quite sure how to verbalize what's going on. Um, my, my son's truck's backed over him. This is one of the worst things that's going to happen in his life, and yet... He's going to um and stutter over saying it to get the urgent help that he so needs. It's noticeable here. He doesn't mention any urgency or what kind of help is needed at all. Instead, he goes into this scene set, this talking about what happened. And he's asked what's going on in the present tense. What is going on? And he replies with what has happened, not what's going on right now. My son is trapped underneath his truck he's unconscious or he's in a real bad way and he needs help fast. No, Aaron decides that the answer to what's going on is to say what's happened in the past. And he seems to be quite clear about what's happened in the most part. The truck backed over his son, rolled over him, dragged him into a ditch and is on top of him. His son is trapped. And that's said with some certainty. And then he says it again. He repeats it, basically, but with less certainty. He's trapped under the truck and I, I, yeah, he, are you, somehow it drug him underneath. He says, oh, when he's asked what's going on, he really twice says what's happened in the past, much more than he says what's actually going on, why he's called 911, what the help is that's needed. And if my interest gone to this part of the start, my son's truck's backed over him, it's rolled over him, so it, it's gone over him twice in this telling of the story, but he changes how he describes it. He starts off by saying it backed over him and he changes that to it rolled over him. Backed over him, there's agency there. It's an action of the truck. Then rolled over him, that's less agency. It's more sort of haphazard, it's, it's more chaotic. Look, my drive of my house um, is on a slope. If I parked my car up there and I'd left the brake off, I say, the car rolled into the front door. However, if I was in my car, going to drive it out the drive, but selected the wrong gear, went into reverse, I'd say, I would backed into the front door. We would expect backed to be used in a vehicle when someone is driving, when someone has control of the vehicle, and rolled to be used when it's an accident, when there's no one in control of what's happened. And I'm curious as to why Aaron says both backed and rolled, and in that order. As if he said it's backed over him and then thinks rolled over is actually a better thing to say here. Then Aaron talks to someone else, and he does this quite a bit in this call. Um, sometimes he's talking to the operator. Sometimes it appears that he's talking to others, I'm guessing, that are around him and the accident at the time. So he says to someone else, yes, my son is under it. I'm trying to, no, I'm trying to call 911. Now we all misspeak at times, and this is one such case because Aaron says he's trying to call 911, when in fact he's succeeding in speaking to 911. As I said at the start, we all misspeak at times, and this could be one such case. But when we're analyzing someone's words, we know discrepancies like these. They may be relevant later. But this is now three times in this call 
and it's you know this must be 20 seconds into it that he's used the word trying remember he say, was saying i'm trying at the start of this call it's interesting three times he's used trying once at the start and twice here the operator asks okay what's your name aaron says oh my god my name is aaron solomon and the operator says and you say aaron says oh my gosh over the top of that the operator continues 1357 southwater avenue right and aaron says yes look at this aaron answers these questions directly and in a straightforward manner so previously when he was asked what's happening he said what was happening it wasn't a directly answering the question here what's your name he gives it my name is aaron solomon and it's 1357 southwater avenue right yes straightforward very few words um there's certainly no desire here to deceive or misdirect attention these are what I call easy questions. These questions have a single answer. That answer is a fact, and the answer is verifiable. So there's no reason, there's no incentive to lie about the answer to any of these. We can pretty much be certain that he's telling the truth about these. In fact, we know for a fact, we know his name is Aaron Solomon, and we know that this is where the accident happened. So he's being straightforward and honest. It can be, you know, these don't look that telling but what they do do is show how Aaron behaves when he has the answer to a question uh, and what how his words are when he's being honest with the answer to the question the operator asks how old is the male and Aaron says he's 18 he just turned 18 a couple of weeks about a month ago that's my son oh my god oh my god this is not good and this is less direct He's asked the age of the male, and he replies with all that is needed. He's 18. And then goes on to provide information that he wasn't asked for. Now, that means it could be important to him, namely when his son, when Grant turned 18. But he's 18. He's not, you know, a toddler, we say, is two years and three months. We don't really speak about an 18-year-old like that. So is the recency of his son turning 18 high in Aaron's mind here? Is that why he's mentioned that Grant had just turned 18? Said earlier, I've seen a few remarks about the delivery of the oh my God parts of this uh, call seeming sort of fake or, or seeming hammy. And I don't look at the delivery in the analysis here, but I do see that phrase, this is not good. Very similar to how Aaron answers um, the questions around his name and where the accident happens this is not good it's very straightforward so there's no doubt in my mind whatever's happened whatever the truth is of what happened Aaron realizes that this is not good the operator asks is he awake and talking to you and Aaron says um please hurry I don't know I don't think so he's not he's not alert right now he's out and he's trapped I got three guys here and he's trapped under the truck. Oh my gosh. Now the police hurry part actually happens over the operator. So he does directly answer this question. Is he awake and talking to you? I don't know is, is what Aaron says. But then look at this. It's just strange because he changes his answer three times. 16 words and he changes his answer three times. He says in reply to the question, is he awake and talking to you? I don't know. That's definite. He doesn't know whether his son is awake or talking to him. And I don't know is a very honest answer. Honest people, people who don't know the answer to things are quite happy to go, I don't know. People who are lying tend to stay away from I don't know. They think that shows some sort of weakness or vagueness. But he says, I don't know. Definite. He does not know whether his son is awake and talking to him. And then he says, I don't think so. So straight away, he's now saying he doesn't know for sure but he seems fairly certain that he's not awake and talking. And then he says, he's not, he's not alert right now, he's out. So he's now so certain that his son is not awake and talking, he's stated it twice, he's not alert and he's out. So within 16 words, Aaron has gone from being certain he doesn't know the answer to this question, is he awake and talking to you? I don't know, to giving us a very certain answer to the question. He's not alert right, uh, he's not alert right now, he's out. Now that, that is weird. We've got a repetition of trapped. He says trapped twice here. We've heard trapped a few times before. Being trapped is a priority concern for Aaron to say. 
Um, but is this a priority in that he wants to ensure the fact that Grant is trapped, is, is heard on the call so they can get equipment or people there to untrap him? Or is he just wanting to get across the fact that Grant is trapped? Is it very important? Is it high in his mind that Grant is trapped? Interesting. Very, very interesting. Um, as he always says he's trapped. He's very straightforward about he's trapped as well. Look about the condition. I don't know. I don't think so. He's not alert. He's, oh, he's out. But he's trapped is always done very, very, very um, straightforwardly. Just going to go back to the last um, uh, thing when we were talking about the age. And Carla has commented, Grant's age was very important to Aaron, in my opinion. Carla, I think I know what you're getting at. Um, and certainly if um, the fact that Grant had just turned 18 and become an adult and potentially that was a problem or an issue or a concern for Aaron, that certainly would come through in those words there as to why he mentioned the how recently his son had turned 18. Carla, thank you very much for your comment. Look back to this one. I got three guys here. Whoa, that's interesting. Why is he telling us this? He's asked, is he awake and talking to you? And part of that answer is, I got three guys here. It's not relevant to the question he's been asked, and he doesn't state anything else about the watching, helping. What? He doesn't mention anything about them, apart from the fact that they're here. Why is he mentioning them? And look at that phrase, I got. That implies some ownership of these three guys. It's not, there are three guys here. It's, I got three guys here, which is something we expect to hear more when there's some sort of ownership, like I got three of my guys working on it, you'll have the results soon, or I got three guys, three guys coming around to um, later to help get that junk out of here. I got three guys here. Why mention that? The operator says, I understand, sir. sir. Stay on the phone with me while we get somebody out there. What's your name? Aaron replies, Aaron Solomon. Again, this very direct answer to the question. And what kind of vehicle is it? It's a Toyota Tacoma. Tacoma. It's a, a, a vehicle. Um, has He's underneath the vehicle. So direct, straightforward, answering of easy factual questions. What's your name? Aaron Solomon. What kind of vehicle is it? A Toyota Tacoma. And then once more, he repeats that his son is under the vehicle. It's a priority concern for him obviously. The operator asks, what color is it? And Aaron says, it's a white truck. That's my son. It's somehow backed up. So I think at this point he's moved on to talk to someone else. Yeah. Yeah. I'm on the, I'm on with 911 right now. Oh my God. Oh my God. Oh my God. So Aaron gives another straightforward answer, um, which is um, that it's a white truck. And then we have the, this uh, repetition of somehow, very, you know, somehow backed up uh, the truck. So he really wants to get across here that he doesn't know what happened. He doesn't know how this truck moved at all. It's somehow backed up. But no, he uses backed up again to describe the truck movement once more. Not rolled. No, the truck backed up. The operator asks, was your son working on it? And Aaron says, no, no, he was just getting out of it. It's the hit, it's the, we're on an incline and I guess he didn't have it in park or something or it wasn't engaged or, oh my gosh, oh my God, I can't believe. Here, the word just is used and just is present so often, so often in deception. Uh, and this case, the, this use of just could be used to focus our attention on just one thing, just one thing was happening, even though there was other things happening, just one thing was happening. And that's the thing I want you to focus on. Aaron's very definite about the events here. His son was getting out of the car when the truck rolling happened. He was just getting out of it. Now that's going to be contradicted in the statement later. Spoiler for you there, but I just want you to remember this. What Aaron says on the phone to 911 just after the event, he was just getting out of it. And now he started to offer up theories as to what happened, but they are theories. He's making sure we know their theories. I guess he didn't have it in part or something, or it wasn't engaged, or uh so again, 
Um, rather than talking about the condition of his son or trying to get his son the best help, trying to explain what sort of help his son Grant needs, he's once again getting across to us that he does not know how this event happened, I guess, or something. And this is really interesting because, again, look at what the question is. Was your son working on it? No, he was just getting out of it. That's all that's needed there. But he goes in to ask, uh, giving information that was not asked for. It's the hill. It's the, we're on an incline. I guess he didn't have it in park. Look, when we're being deceptive, we repeat the deceptive words frequently. Uh, why do we do that? Well, there's two reasons we can do that. Number one, we think if something is more believable if we repeat it. Hey, if I've said it seven times, then, you know, it must be true because I've said it lots of times. Or it could be it's really important for us to make sure that the other person has heard the deception so we don't just leave it to the chance of saying it once and then, well, maybe they'll get it, maybe they won't. We feel if we repeat it again and again and again, it will really sink in that our message will get across. Um, and certainly I'm seeing here, I'm not saying it's deceptive, but what I am seeing here is lots of times, especially when it's not being asked for, Aaron repeating that he doesn't know how events occurred. Now, why is he doing that? Right, next, the operator says something that sounds to me like he's not responding, and Aaron says, no, no, and he's still, and Aaron says, no, no, again. The operator tries to calm him down. I'm just asking you the questions so we can get to him, okay? Can you check and see if he's breathing? Aaron says, I, I, somebody tell, it's telling me he, he, he's coming to. And the operator says, okay, he's waking up. Try to keep him still. Uh, and Aaron says, well, he can't, yeah, he can't move. I don't think he can move. I, I don't know. At the end there, another example of Aaron changing the certainty in a short amount of time. He says, he can't move. That's definite and certain. And then he says, I don't think he can move. That's less definite and certain. And then he says, I don't know. That's not at all definite or certain. So he's gone from he can't move, very definitive. He can't move to, I don't know whether he can move or not. That's the second time we've seen that. And both times that Aaron has done this, it's been about the state, the condition of his son, Grant. What's going on there? Is he covering all bases? Is he trying to get across? He's not accurately aware of his son's condition. Or again, is there the possibility that this is deception mode and he's not entirely sure what is the correct statement? So he gives three very different statements. He can't move. But I don't think he can move. I don't know if he can move or not. It carries on. The operator says, well, okay. And Aaron says, no, he can't move. He's trapped. Okay, we got somebody on route now. When he wakes up, he may be scared. Can somebody talk to him? And Aaron says, yes, yeah, somebody talk to him. There's shit, there's there's blood. And then he talks aside again, so it's not as if to the operator. Is he facing up or down? He's facing up. He said, we may aspirate. We need to hurry. Oh, my God. Doctor, The doctor? The operator then goes on to say, so does he have blood coming out of his mouth? And Aaron says, yeah, he, yeah, there's blood coming up. Yeah, somehow it drug him down, I think. I don't know whether it was in wasn't in park or what if it didn't engage the brake or drug him underneath somehow they said he's facing up now this is a confused part of the call Aaron appeals to be talking to the operator and to someone at the scene but there's a lack of consistency here in some parts Aaron appears to be relaying information from someone else so he's said um, on the previous slide I think we can see it um is he facing up or facing down? So he's asking for information, saying that he can't say it. And then he says, they said he's facing up um, there. Um, yeah, they said he's facing up. So uh, he's getting information from another party. But then in other parts, he's conveying the information more directly. There's blood coming up. That inconsistency, con that inconsistency concerns me. In most parts of the call, Aaron appears to be speaking with direct knowledge of his son's condition. In others, he appears to be getting this information secondhand. It's just, it's a little bit weird. But as we can see, um, Aaron is very clear that his son is trapped. He mentions it again. Um, he says his son is trapped. And also, once again, he tells us he doesn't know what happened. This is another repeat of doesn't know what happened. 
an aspirate, which was on the previous slide. He said we may aspirate. We need to hurry. Now, aspirate is not a common word. What I have to say is I've listened to this call um, in good quality headphones, very loud, and I do hear someone, not Aaron, saying the word aspirate um, in the background. But aspirate is not a common word. So where did that come from? Aspirate is going to come from someone with medical knowledge, maybe someone with first aid training. I guess, you know, you're at a baseball facility. Potentially there's people there with um, first aid training. Um, but yeah, I kind of, I I'm not some psychic or anything like that, but I get the feeling that someone there had some first aid training or, or medical knowledge, if that's at all helpful. The operator says, okay. And Aaron now talks directly about what's happening. It's not relaying information. He's bleeding from his mouth. So Grant, turn your face to the side if you can. Barely, be careful. And the operator says, don't move him. Okay. And Aaron says, we can't move him. We can't, we can't move him. Then Aaron says, oh God. And the operator says, they're here. I'm going to let you go. Okay. So again, here... Aaron has moved from having this third hands or second hand, sorry, uh, information because he doesn't appear to be anywhere near to talking directly to Grant. I, Aaron might have moved since he had to ask which way Grant is facing because he couldn't see, but there's an inconsistency between what is going on here. And then we can't move him. Who's we? Is this what the three men are involved in? So that's the 911 call. Do you have any comments about the 911 call? Anything that I've missed or anything you think I've got wrong or anything like that? Now is a good time to get them in the, the, the chat if you like. Um, look, there's a lot of honesty in this call. Um, you can see it there. He's very direct when he's asked easy and factual questions. He's very straightforward about his son being trapped under the truck. He repeats that a lot. Aaron does seem to be concerned about getting help quickly into the correct location. However, there are concerns. The number one concern is how often he repeats he doesn't know how this happened, how he doesn't know how the truck rolled over Grant. Here's some theories I've got. I'm telling you theories because I don't know somehow this happened. I guess this is what happened or something. It's a massive priority in Aaron's mind to ensure that he says here, and it's recorded, that he doesn't know what happened. He's certain he's trapped, but he's very vague about the condition of Grant as well. At times he says he doesn't know the conditions, at other times he says he's much sure of conditions. He seems to cover a lot of bases. Look, I wasn't there. I don't know what for certain what happened. But from the statements on this call, Aaron knows more about how this truck moved than he's letting on in that call that would be my opinion there those are my thoughts on the call listen we're going to look at the statement but while i take a breather if you enjoy this please share it on social media it helps get the word out there press the like button as well that also helps other people find content like this um and um if you've got any comments or anything, put them in the live chat. If you're watching on replay, like I say, uh, then do give us the comments and subscribe as well. If you want more videos like this, something else you could do in the comments or the chat, if you like, while I take a drink is um, if you've got any recommendations for content around this, any podcasts or uh, videos or anything like that, then why not put them in there as well? Because this is it's a really fascinating story with so many facets all, I think, based around a campaign to have this death reinvestigated. I, you know, I don't see many people pointing a finger and going, this person needs to be in jail for this crime. But what people are saying um, is that um, they, they, they want an investigation. And I'm going to show you why they want an investigation in a minute um, from the statement. I may just go back, first of all, to Carla again. I do, I believe Aaron was speaking to the WPI. So WPI was the, the facility they were at, wasn't it? The WPI employee who said that he went into the ditch to check on Grant. So that would make a lot of sense, Carla. Yeah, that um, this information is coming secondhand. Um, I, I, yeah, the, the, like I say, there is that inconsistency in his words where sometimes he's saying what happens. Certainly, like I said, Aaron knows Grant is trapped. 
He knows that for certain, and he says it very straightforwardly and directly a lot. He's underneath the truck. He's trapped. But when it comes to talking about his condition, things that you would have to make, um, uh, you know, maybe closer inspection of, then he's very vague on those. He covers a lot of bases, and he seems to be getting the information that he is um, getting on that uh, secondhand from someone else. So that could be the, the WPI employee. Thank you very much for that, Carla. Um, right, let's move on to the statement. And there it is. Can I tell you, I, I'm in the UK. You may be able to tell from the accident, the, the accident from the um, from the accent. Um, and whenever there is a death that could be an accident, man, we go to great lengths to investigate it. We will shut down entire freeways if someone dies in a car crash to investigate that death and how it happened. No matter what time of day it is, lots of people will not get to work if someone dies on the freeway on the uh, when rush hour is on. Our police, who are not the best, they will close the motorway. You will be driving down that motorway the next day and there'll be big signs up asking for witnesses to come forward or people to share videos um, if, they were, if they have cameras on their cars. Um, so, yeah, um, that's a statement. That, that's the entire statement that um, Aaron gave to law enforcement about the, the incident. And here are the words. My son Grant and I pulled into WPI separately, parked side by side. I was still in my car, but noticed my son got out to get his baseball gear out the back of his truck. I looked down to check a work email. And the next thing I know, I hear C, and there's a little mark there, but both the words hear and C are, are there in the statement. I hear C, the truck, rolling, I think it is, but it could be roll. Uh, I hear see the truck rolling backwards into the ditch. I get out of my car to try to find my son and saw that he was trapped underneath the truck and immediately called 911. And that is the statement. 88 words in total. 88 words of statement. And you can break it down. The blue part there is 51 words long. 51 words, so more than half of that 88, leading up to the incident. Nearly two-thirds of the statement is scene set before what happened. The green part, 33 words, are dealing with the incident itself. And the orange, four words, are the aftermath. Now, there's nothing wrong with a scene set in a statement, but not one as long as this. Why would it be longer than the description of the incident. It can be an indicator of deception. The scene set is easy to do. There's little stress in talking about the innocuous details before the incident. Someone may enjoy spending a lot of time on the scene set, all the stuff that you can say that's easy to say if the incident, if the deception of the incident is going to be stressful. The incident could be stressful because it's described deceptively, or it could be a traumatic occasion as well, which is why There'll be a lot of talk before getting to talk to the traumatic part of it. Why is the incident part so short? It could be because it's not true. When we haven't experienced something, it's hard to manufacture that experience. We don't have lots of words to describe what's happened. So that could be why the incident part is so short. It could be because it's it's very traumatic. Although it doesn't seem to be much traumatic described in that because um, he's saying he didn't really say anything. So what I notice about this scene set here, or, or the whole thing actually, is that um, it's told in quite a distant way. I noticed my son got out to get his baseball gear. Not my son got out to get his baseball gear. He's telling us how he experienced it and what he experienced. I noticed my son got out. Not my son got out. I hear and see the truck rolling, not the truck was rolling or the, the you know, the truck was rolling backwards. It's I hear and see the truck rolling again, how I experienced it. And again, I saw he was trapped underneath the truck. He doesn't actually say I, which is another something. Saw that he was trapped underneath the truck, not he was trapped underneath the truck, but saw that he was trapped underneath the truck. Really curious use of language kind of distant and kind of a, a all about, I noticed this, I heard this, I saw this. It's not direct as to what happened. What else have we got on this? 
There's a mispronoun. My son Grant and I pulled into WPI separately, part side by side. Doesn't explicitly say who part side by side. Not we part side by side, just part side by side. Dropped pronouns, where we would expect a pronoun can be quite telling, and there certainly is one there. Okay, here's a big one for me. The next thing I know, the next thing I know is regularly used to skip details that we don't want to convey. Now, this can be because they are irrelevant or because we're being brief, but it can also be when we're hiding something. For irrelevant or brief, I could be saying, I was driving along the motorway, I joined at junction five, I was driving along, and next thing I know, a car pulls out in front of me. Now, that's obviously not the next thing I know. You know, there's other things that happen, but I'm short-circuiting this. I'm taking a shortcut on this and using the next thing I know to avoid the boring and irrelevant details. But it can also be used to hide things. You know, yeah, I put that Netflix box set on at 10 o'clock. Next thing I know, it's 3 o'clock and I've got work in the morning. Now, that's not the next thing you know. You realize, should I watch another episode? Yeah, go on. Yeah, I'll, I'll watch another one. God, it's getting late and I've got work in the morning. Oh, no. When you tell it to someone else, you hide all those thoughts and the fact you knew you were doing something wrong and you say, I put the Netflix box set on. Next thing I know, it's three o'clock in the morning. So the next thing I know I'm interested in, why is that there? What is being skipped? What is being jumped over with that phrase? And the next thing I know. Okay, next observation. Look, 88 words. I have so much to say on this statement. Um, I Let's just take the word C out of this for a moment. I hear the truck rolling backwards. Can you hear a truck rolling backwards? Can you? I think you could hear a truck rolling, kind of. I do believe you could hear a truck rolling, but can you hear the direction of the roll? No. You could hear a truck rolling, but you can't hear it rolling backwards. Now, it does have the word C in there. I can't take the word C out and pretend it doesn't exist. But I just, it's not fluid. More, more comforting would be something fluid. I heard the truck roll or I heard a noise and turned to see the truck rolling backwards. Not I heard the truck roll and turn, uh, I, I heard the truck roll backwards. Interesting turn of phrase. I got out of my car to try to find my son. This is interesting. Because he doesn't mention that he thought his son was missing. He doesn't mention he feared his son had been hit or affected in some way by the roll. And kind of that's fine. It's a shocking incident. Events happen too fast to form any expectations. But he doesn't say why his initial reaction was that Grant had to be found. Why is he not saying to check Grant was okay? To check on Grant? To see where Grant was? No, he seems to think Grant's been lost. That's his first instinct. Grant has been lost because he goes to try to find my son. He says he didn't see anything. So how does he know he's lost? How does he know he's missing? He's unable to be seen at that point. I get out of my car to try to find my son. He doesn't mention that his son is not there. Um, what else have I got here? Tenses. Let's look at the tenses here. When we tell stories of things that happened in the past, we use past tense. When we tell things that are happening presently, we use present tense. We don't really expect much mix, but we get some here. Grant and I pulled past tense into WPI, part past tense side by side. I was still in my car. I noticed, past tense, my son got out. I looked down, past tense, um, then towards the end. I saw he was trapped and immediately called 911. So all in past tense, the red bits are past tense. But these blue bits are in present tense. I hear, see the truck rolling. I get out of my car, not I got out of my, my not I got out of my car, not I saw the truck rolling. These are in present tense why that change? Well, one reason we can use present tense when we're using past, uh, talking about past events is because actually we're making them up. So they're not in the part of our mind, which is where we get things from the past and we bring them out and we put them in past tense. We're making up the pictures in our minds in the present, which is why we use or can slip into present tense because actually these things are happening 
in the present time in our heads. Is that what's what's going on in here? It, present tense can also be used with traumatic events when people are reliving trauma. That could be what's happening here. But whatever, there's an interesting use of present tense in where we would be expecting past tense here. Now, this is what did I say? 88 words long, this statement. So word economy was big in this statement. You know, no words were wasted here, except they were. Some interesting words pulled into the WPI separately. Why say separately? Why is it important to say that at all? The statement would mean the same thing if it said we pulled into WPI. Why tell us he got his baseball gear out the back of his truck? Why not just tell us he was at the back of his truck or going into the back of his truck? Why tell us baseball gear? It would make as much sense. The meaning would be the exact same if baseball gear wasn't mentioned. Why tell us it was a work email? Why not just check on an email? Is that to make sure you're, okay, I'm not negligent. I was doing something really important. It was a work email, you know? It wasn't just any old email. It wasn't Amazon telling me my box was coming later on today. It, it was a work email. So therefore, I was doing a very important thing, and that's the reason why I didn't see what happened. And why tells you immediately called 911? Kind of doesn't change. I called 911. Why tell us immediately? Why have all these words been added? And this is something that, that really gets to me. I think that there's some some truth behind these words that have been added. I'm particularly interested in the baseball gear. How? Because, look, they arrive separately. There is no interaction at all between them noted in this statement at all. There's, you know, we didn't, we arrived separately, part side by side, did you really, did your son really pull up and you didn't have any interaction, not a wave, uh, an open of the window, you're all right, I'm just checking my emails, or, you know, are you going to get your stuff? There's no interaction whatsoever noted here. So, um, right, how does he know it was baseball gear that he was going to get out the back of his truck? Because he says he went, um, notice my son, got out to get, so he hasn't got, to get his baseball gear, and then I looked down. So how does he know he went into the back of his truck to get his baseball gear? There was no interaction, so there wasn't, I'll get my gear out the back of the car and I'll be with you in a second. How does he know it was his baseball gear? Uh, why is it important to tell us they arrived separately? And why is it important to say he immediately called 911? So listen, I've, I've been looking at some of the... Um, uh, conversations you've been having on the chat and we'll do some of those in a moment but if you've got any other observations or thoughts or questions even then uh, do get them in the live chat right now or if you're watching on replay put them in the comments but what do I see across these two statements I see storytelling or um, you know real perception management going on I didn't know what was happening uh, somehow this happened here's some theories on that call, on that 911 call, there's no sense of priority for help. What kind of help is needed? There's a lack of detail in the statement to law enforcement, but some strange detail in that statement to law enforcement that doesn't need to be there. It's put there for a reason. We deliberately use the words that we want to use. I don't know what happened is very important. It's his repeated concept all the way through that 911 call, even above the condition of his son. When he's asked about the condition of his son, he vaguely talks about it and then says how much he doesn't know how what happened happened. That's strange. Um, what I would like to know more about are the arrangements on the day and their interactions prior to events. I think that word separately reveals a lot. I think there has there's been some interaction. I think it is very strange. What do you think? Uh, let's have a look at some of your thoughts. So, um, Carla said, I believe Aaron was speaking to the WPI employee who said that he went to the ditch to check on Grant, and we spoke about that earlier. I said that is entirely possible. And we'll talk about Ange in a minute. Not to be contradictory, the W. PBI employee said he stood at the top of the ditch and could see Grant. He never went all the way down. Uh, she then says, I think it's likely that that employee did not tell the truth. 
Uh, Carla says, I could have sworn that the WPI said he himself went into the ditch when he spoke to a reporter. Um, then from Carla again, WPI employee said he saw Grant moving his head and eyes, no blood. So I think he was in the ditch. Not sure how close and relaying details to Aaron. So that kind of, uh, I think, potentially clears that one up. Another one from Carla. It's 100% impossible that Grant was dragged by his truck into the ditch. What amazes me is that Aaron could craft this lie so quickly. Chris, why didn't he immediately go down to be with his son? Why deliberately stay away from him? Um, Chris, I think that's a great question. It's not one for me. So um, uh, I'm not going to deal with that one. But I, I do think it is a great question. And I know lots of people have said that uh, it's really weird um, the father of a son who's trapped underneath a truck isn't anywhere near the truck. Uh, Ange talked to the employee, um, and uh, this is the, the one of the day for me. Ange says, so informative. Ange is Grant's mum. Ange, I hope I've been fair to you in this. Um, I have immense um, respect for how you've carried yourself um since um i've been aware of you um ultimate you know real sadness as to losing your son three years ago i cannot imagine the pain um that is there and i cannot imagine the pain and the circumstances of, of losing your son uh so i i kind of hope that has been helpful um as i said earlier i know that you want uh, an investigation a proper investigation into this um, and um, I hope that uh, anything that I can do and these other podcasts and um, videos that are being made can help just get that momentum just to have an investigation. <laughs> let's just have a bloody investigation into what happened and let's take it from there. Listen, thank you for being there. I've taken up more than enough of your time. Um, but thank you very much for joining us and we'll have another video soon from Never a Truer Word.